Thank Thanks. you very Thanks much. Thanks to you. And very happy to be here. I have these slides here, so I won't be able to see you in detail. I come from Cornell University, a small town in Ithaca, New York. Let me pass here. And I'm going to talk to you uh, about chemistry. How many of you guys have a chemistry major? How many of you guys like chemistry in high school? OK, good. This is better than most of the audience I have to talk to. So, <laughs> so uh, these are actually my students. I'm going to talk to you about how chemistry can modify fibers and how fibers can become high performance materials. Uh, this is my town. Ithaca, New York, a small lake. Uh, we are a member of the Ivy League. We have campuses in Ithaca, in Manhattan, and in Doha. And uh, we have 43 Nobel Prize winners uh, associated with the university, and um, about four major nanotechnology centers in such a small town in New York. Uh, so before I start, uh, I follow the advice of the people in uh, sports advertisement. So I give thanks to the people who sponsor my research. And I also follow your advice in size. The size of the logo is proportional to the amount of money that they give me. <laughs> uh, sometimes my students in 3M or Google tell me that their logo is too small, so I tell them that the, there's a solution to that problem, yeah. So it's a solution to do. Um, I work in two diff very, um, uh, the big contrast areas, uh, small materials, which was a revolution at the end of the 1990s, and textiles, which happens to be the beginning industry of the Industrial Revolution uh, uh, in the 1700s. So my job is how to merge 200 years of innovation, how to make something old and traditional into something new and revolutionary. And to do that, I choose one of the most important materials for humans, cotton. I can guarantee that about 100% of the people in this audience has an item of cotton next to the skin. Is that right? Good. <laughs> And there is something about cotton. You know, there's a lot of synthetic fibers out outside, but cotton is something that we feel comfortable with. And my job is how to make cotton to do things that cotton doesn't do, how to make cotton become an engineered fiber. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of the chemistry that we do, and then we're going to discuss some of the examples in sports. But this is my inspiration. So I'm sure you know many of them. In fact, um, yesterday I went running and I saw a lot of advertisements about the Wonder Woman. It's a very good movie. But uh, even though you know many of these characters, very few of you know probably that these characters were designed in 1938, before World War II. And these characters were designed when these materials did not exist. So there were no textiles capable of stopping bullets. There were no textiles capable of stopping fire. There were no textiles capable of making you go very fast in the water. But that did not prevent the designers to imagine that these materials were possible, that someday they will be possible. And it took about 40 years, 40 years of chemistry to make these materials a reality. So today, we have these materials available, yeah? In fact, yesterday, I, I was fascinated by some of the presentations that show some of these high-performance materials. Um, I was very inspired by these cartoons because it shows that if you have a vision, a creative vision, the science can follow up. And unfortunately now, science and design seems to be separated, going into di different directions, and what we do is how to connect science driving design and design driving science. I come from a department called Fiber Science and Apparel Design. It means that we have scientists and we have designers. So it's a schizophrenic department, yeah. Right brain, left brain. But that has been fascinating for me because as a chemist, I never had so much fun in my life, yeah. I have been able to merge these two disciplines, design and science, because we think so differently. So engineers or scientists like me, when we have a big problem, we take the big problem and divide it into small pieces. And we, we, we try to compile the solution of the small pieces and pull ourselves to think that the final solution is a combination of the individual solutions. That's not true. Designers, on the other hand, can see the final solution in their head. But they don't know how to go there. But they can see it. So what we do is to merge these two ways of thinking, design and science. 
So I'm going to give you a couple examples. One of them, it has to deal with protective clothing. As you saw, the biggest, the biggest sponsor of my research is the military. So this has to deal with protective clothing against chemical and biological warfare. So you can have one extreme where uh, you are protected against everything. No vapors, no liquids, no gases go through you. But at the same time, you cannot breathe. Yeah, so that's maybe a two minute protection, but very good one. Uh, if you go to the military, the current, the current um, chem bio suit has a layer of carbon that absorbs some of these chemicals and protect you against that. But, but what I want to do is to create layers that can protect you against every single chemical. Imagine for a second that you can have a layer that protects you against one chemical. In a fire, for example, you are exposed to hundreds of them, hundreds of chemicals. So if you put more than maybe four t-shirts, how do you feel? Yeah, extremely hot, you cannot move, very uncomfortable. But what I do is I make these t-shirts one molecule thick, yeah? How, how small is that? About 20 nanometers. So I'm gonna give you an idea what a nanometer is. So everybody knows what a meter is. You divide by 10, it's about the width of your palm. You divide by 10, it's about the, um, the width of your pinky finger. You divide by 10, you get the width of your hair. You divide by 10, then you have a, bac a bacteria. You divide by 10, you have a blood cell. You divide by 10, and then you get a virus, the size of virus. And then you divide by 10 again, and that's my domain, yeah? It's a very, very small domain. In fact, my rule is if I can see it, it's too big for me. I work on very small things. So I can make these things 20 nanometers thick, and I can, okay, something happened here. Uh, what happened with that side? Okay, there was an image here in which I show that I can only do 20 nanometers, but I can also do 50 angstroms, which is 10 times smaller than that. And the next one is I can put very small particles on top of these fibers. And I can use the two different approaches. If you want to know the chemistry, I'll be happy to explain to you after, w after a while. Um, and I can put the particles so close to each other that then I can create color without using dyes. So this is called physical color. So I can place this, control the space between particles and the particle size, and I can make any color I want. And it was a color that will never fade because it's a physical color. I'm just playing with the light. Um, now, I have a fashion design student in my, uh, in my college, uh, Olivia, and she decided to make these dresses. And all the colors in th those dresses are actually made with nanoparticles. So you can have gold nanoparticle, this blue one, this is silver, ruthenium. So we can make any color. And that was fun. That was a fun exercise. But then we find out that the particles were so small that we can actually kill bacteria in large amounts. So we can kill gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So that gives us an incredible possibilities for medical, medical devices based on these textiles, uh, sports uh, uh, fabrics, as well as food protection and packaging, and all that because of the we control the size at a very, very small domain. The next step is we decided to make particles, smaller particles, and put them on top of the small particles, yeah? Because it's never, people say that it's never big for me. I say it's never small for me, yeah? I wanna always want to go smaller. And I can put them so small that I can now have surfaces like cotton that will never get wet. So they are they don't get wet by water, they don't get stained by oil. So these surfaces will never get wet and kill bacteria at the same time. Um, based on that, what I wanted to do is to actually transfer an electron from one point to the other. And what we did is we're able to, this is the only chemistry slide, so please forgive me. So we can place a catalyst on the particles and then inject the monomer, and then we can make cotton to be conducted. So now we can have conduct electricity on a thread of cotton that looks like cotton, it can be sewn, it can be stitched. And then I have a student, another student, that uh, decided to make a dress and then use solar cells to charge an iPhone. And at the same time, she was sewing the dress, she was connecting all the electronics with the same cotton fiber. Um, we decided that transferring the electricity may be very simple, yeah, it's a very passive movement, 
But now, buddy buddy, we can make electronics out of textiles. Instead of attaching electronics to textiles like most people do, I would like to make the electronic components inside the textiles. So we made transistors, the basic component of an electronic device made of cotton. So we make cotton transistors, yeah? So we make two types of transistors, an uh, electrochemical transistor and a fuel electrical transistor. So now we can make operations, computation based on transistors. That is a single thread. So imagine for a second in your shirt, how many intersections of fibers are in your shirt, yeah? About 400,000 for each single shirt, a woven one. So imagine that each one of them is a transistor. So now you have a mini computer in your clothing. It's not attached to, it is your clothing, yeah. So we have these ideas of making computations to making calculations based on cotton, yeah. So we were about 500 years behind the Incas in Peru because they have this device and they were able to do math with textiles, yeah. My job is to make the same device called a kipu, but a digital one with electronic cotton. Now, these are the molecules that I have more excited. This is my recent work. These molecules are very precise. The yellow ball is a gas, this is a cavity, and then you have a metal and an organic device, so they are called metal organic frameworks. So we can tailor these molecules to open, to close, and to create different geometric patterns. So the first one, we work with a fashion designer who is now in London, uh, in uh, Central St. Martins, and she wanted to design a piece of garment when she went running. She didn't want her hair to smell like the exhaust of a car. So we designed a molecule that will capture some of those gases and will prevent you from smelling that. And that was a fascinating project for me. And then the next one was a student I have uh, from the Gambia. So she told me, well, you can capture the gas, but about if you can capture and release, yeah? So we designed a molecule to capture an insecticide, and then we can have this insecticide and release at the time when the mosquito is more active, yeah? Each mosquito, the Zika mosquito, malaria mosquito, has a very different time. So we can tailor these, these uh, linkers to open based on the exposure to UV, so we can release the insecticide at the time the mosquito is more active. And then she made the dress. Of course, she's a fashion designer, so she made the dress. So this here, right there. Now, I can also take the same molecules, and this came from last year, and I, I can change the metals, and now I can make color. I can make red color with europium. I can make blue color with gallinidium. I can make terbium to be green. So now I have RGB, red, green, and blue, based on a textile. So your, your T-shirt can become a screen. So I can make any color by a combination of this red, green, and blue, and I can have an interactive display based on a cotton surface, yeah? Um, and I can make it look white under certain light, then I change the wavelength of the light and it will look green or red for the Manchester United or any other color. And that's because I can control the, the matter at this level, very, very small level. Now we can make chemistry, these, these molecules in very different um, spaces in, very in different colors. And then last year I was invited to the Football Club Barcelona and as they asked me to think about applications for sports. And that was a fascinating journey for me because I'm a, I just, I'm a chemist. Uh, I'm actually not a very uh, fan of sports except cycling. So what this, the thing that I did is I tried to think how I can use these molecules into sports. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples that came because I was, uh, Monday we were in Roland Garros, so I have a couple examples of what I think these molecules can be used. So the first one is what about if we have these fibers that can react to friction and speed? So then you can track the speed of the ball as it moves on the court. So I know there are some nice radars because we went to the IBM center, but for the amateur, for the people that work on the street, you can see the color, how fast you hit the ball, how fast it's coming. Um, next one uh, has to deal with the tension. So I have molecules that are responsive to tension. So tennis players are very sensitive to the tension in the rackets. So if, I can, can, if you can monitor in real time with the color, what is the tension value of your racket, then, then you can feel much, much free on that. Now the next one has to deal with how to understand sweat. 
So I can use the same textile, capture sweat, and then understand the amount of polyelectrolytes, the amount of pH, and can tell you a message, okay, you need hydration, uh, you need a particular um, electrolyte in your, in your beverage. The last one has to deal with the pressure. So I noticed that they change the balls like every few matches. So it's because the pressure changes. But what about if the, the color of the ball changes as a function of pressure? So then you can play more, more uh, with the same ball. And this one is for a fault if your feet is close to, to the line. So all these things are possible with textiles for tennis. But uh, some of the examples I'm going to show you here because I only have a few minutes left. Uh, the examples for soccer. And this was an idea last year when I went to Barcelona. Now it's a reality. And here is the structure. So those of you who want to know the chemical structure. <laughs> so what about if somebody grabs your shirt and the referee is behind you, uh, like happened in some, some matches, yeah? So now you can have evidence, evidence that the person actually grabbed your shirt, yeah? Change the color and then goes back. Um, next one, what happened if the ball hits your hand? There is a marker, so it's a pressure-induced color. So there's no way to say, no, I didn't touch me. Uh, the next one was not a very popular idea. So because the company wants to sell many t-shirts, but I can have one single t-shirt that makes all the different colors, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but that was not very popular. That was not very well received, uh, but that was fun. And we always keep pushing these limits. Uh, and I'm very grateful of uh, SIS because I was just a chemistry professor. And one day I got a phone call from Munir and from Arnaud. He says, would you mind to come to this event? He says, I'm just a professor. He says, what, what do you want me to, to do there? And thanks to that, they sparked these ideas in my imagination. I transferred that to my team of chemists from all over the world, and we came with these solutions, yeah? It's the power of chemistry that can do things that we never thought it was possible. And it was possible because somebody had a different way of thinking either a designer or a sports networking person or a sports fan. So now I'm a big fan of, of uh, uh, SIS, and I want to start by saying thank you very much, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, but before that, I'm going to ask you a favor. So please tweet to my college. So, <laughs> so my dean knows that I'm actually doing some work. Yeah. <laughs> Because we just have we just have the college graduation last week, and I immediately flew here. So they say it must be a very important academic event. Say so yeah, it's going to be very important. So, <laughs> <laughs> so of course I'm not going to show you these pictures. But thank you very much to the organization, and thank you for your Bravo. time.